Welcome to Redeemer. We are so glad you're here. While you're with us, we hope you feel God's presence and are able to meet some friendly faces. We wanted to take just a minute and let you know about three of the best next steps you can take here at Redeemer to get connected. The first is to fill out a connection card. If you're here in person, the connection card is located in the seat back pocket in front of you. And if you're tuning in online, simply click the connect tab, either in the chat or at the top of your screen window. Our team can't wait to meet you. The second next step to take is to join us for the growth track. The growth track is a three-step series of classes designed to help you connect with Redeemer, to help us connect with you, and to help you connect with others through serving. Lunch and childcare are provided. The third next step will help you build life-giving relationships at Redeemer Church, either by joining in our group or joining us on Wednesday nights at 7.15 for midweek. We have a variety of classes for the whole family, and this is a great way to connect with others on a deeper level. At 6.30 p.m., we have a catered dinner, and then at 7.15, our classes begin. Our desire is to help you take your next step here at Redeemer Church. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and we look forward to meeting you.
you're here this morning, let's worship the Lord together.
powerful here for a moment. You know, when people speak out in unison, there, there's something in the unity of those voices. You know, when we speak that way, what we see that in Revelation as they're there around the throne and they're, they're saying, holy, holy, like all these voices joining with angels and archangels, it's powerful. You know, in, in, in Old Testament times and even in the early church, the way that people would be discipled the way that people would be instructed was a time of call and response. They would use scripture. They didn't all have their own copies of the Bible. They couldn't go on Amazon and order the Psalms. You know? And so the way that they did that was through oral tradition and the teaching of the rabbis. And one of the rabbinical traditions is a call and response. A rabbi would speak a part of the Psalm and his disciples would respond. This is how they would do a lot. Even Jesus on the cross, in some ways, when he was speaking out some of those Psalms, what he's doing is saying to his disciples, they would pick it right up from there and know exactly. He's referencing a messianic Psalm right from the cross. And so we're gonna join right now. This tradition continued on even in the early church in responsive readings. We're gonna, Kathleen is gonna lead us in a Psalm and she's gonna say part and then we are gonna respond with the next part as one voice speaking out God's word. This is just God's word, a time of call and response as a part of our worship. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh also longs after you. Thus I have looked upon you in your holy place. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. As long as I live, I will magnify you. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. When I remember you on my bed. Because you have been my helper. My soul clings to you. Thank you, Jesus.
the truth this morning. empty too. We're so thankful, God, that we can stand here as your people, as your church, to worship you, to lift up the name of the living God, the name that is above every other name. So God, we know that no matter what we're facing this morning, no matter what circumstance we each find ourselves in, that because of Jesus Christ and because of that empty tomb, we all have a reason to worship this morning. God, we give you our praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor that you and you alone deserve. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray together this morning. Amen. Come on, church, one more time. Just lift up a shout of praise to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Well, we're gonna send our elementary age kids out with Pastor Eastman and his team. They'll be right across the hall, and then they will return to you at the end of the message so you can celebrate communion as a family. And as you're seated, would you take just a second to say good morning to someone around you? Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see all of you today. My name is Lydia Sasser, and I just wanna say welcome. We are so honored and excited that you chose to spend part of your Sunday with us. And if this is your first time here, we would love to connect with you. And an easy way for you to do that is to take the Connect card out of the seat back pocket in front of you and fill that out. And then you can bring it to our Welcome Center that's in our main lobby. And if you're joining us online, you can click Connect at the top of your screen. There are a couple exciting things coming up that I wanna highlight this morning. The first one is the Desert Winds Outreach Day, where we're joining with local churches to serve local refugees at the Desert Winds apartment. That's happening this upcoming Saturday, July 30th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And if you have any questions on that, or if you'd like to let them know that you're coming, you can email Pastor Mark at mark at redeemerpv.com. The next thing we have coming up is the Redeemer Worship Night, and that's happening in just one week. We are so excited for this. We are excited and expectant for what the Lord has planned on that night. So we would love for you to join us if you're able. Child care is provided, and it's from 6 to 8 p.m. here at Redeemer. This morning, we have an opportunity to continue in worship through giving our tithes and our offerings. So I wanna direct your attention to the screens. There are multiple ways that you can give this morning. The easiest is if you scan the QR code with your smartphone and it'll take you exactly where you need to go, or you can give securely using our church app. And if you're joining us online, you can click give in the chat right now or at the top of your screen. As we prepare to give, we wanna take time to pray for another church in our city as one of the ways that we make sure as a church to stay dedicated to unity. 
This morning, we're praying for Greenhouse Church of Jacksonville. They're a new church plant at UNF, and they've asked us to pray for open doors and divine opportunities to reach UNF students with the good news of the gospel. So will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we come before you right now. We surrender our hearts to you, this morning to you, our lives to you, God. We pray over the tithes and the offerings right now. We ask that you would bless them, that you would multiply them, and that you would help them to meet the needs of missionaries and ministries around the world. God, we lift up Greenhouse Church of, Church of Jacksonville right now. We ask for divine opportunities and open doors for them to reach the students at UNF, God. We love you and we thank you and we give this day to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And thank you for praying for Greenhouse Church. I'm very excited about that church plant here uh, starting at UNF. They actually, their, their home church is in Gainesville and they're an Assembly of God church there in Gainesville that had a huge impact down there. Tons of college students from the University of Florida and Santa Fe attend that uh, school. Some of our students that have gone down there to go to school have been at that church and we've done outreach with, with them before. So it's very exciting that they're planning a church here. Continue to pray for them uh, throughout the week as it comes to your mind. Greenhouse Church right here at UNF in Jacksonville. We had a team we prayed over a couple weeks ago that went to Uganda. They've been over the past couple weeks at the Akoa Refuge in Uganda and I wanted you to get a chance to hear a little bit about that from them today, actually from Mac. Mac Jackson, would you come on up here? And any of the team that was with him in Uganda, you guys just come on up as well. Uh, ben, any of the other students that were there, y'all come on up and join us up here. Mac Jackson. And um, they had, and um, you guys just come on in behind here. They had an amazing trip and they have lots of stories which they cannot all share with you right now. I know you wanna hear and I know they wanna tell you. Um, you can you know, ask them, uh, more about their trip later. Uh, they'll be out in, in the lobby and over in the missions area. But Mac's going to share a little bit. But I wanted to share something with you first. They were sending us, you know, pictures and reports. And I got to see all the stuff these guys are doing, praying for people, leading people to the Lord. But there was one video that really stood out that I had to, I probably watched it a dozen times. And this is a very, oh no, this guy, he, he's the chairman of our board, okay? <laughs> he does important things. And, uh, but let me show you what he's willing to do. Paul said, I'll do anything to reach people, right? I'll, to, I'll become all things to all people. Let me show you our chairman of the board in Uganda. Check it out. <laughs> Come on, that's it right there, man. Whatever it takes, right? That's, hey, that's what happens when you're Pentecostal. The Holy Spirit comes on you, right? I mean, that's just him having a great time with those kids, and you can see them having a great time. But Matt, go ahead and tell a little bit about what was happening just before that video. For, for the kids, right? Yeah. Kids. Now, um, so that actually, uh, that, the, all the, the kids that you see here were dancing uh, for the kids at the end of a medical mission time that we had all day. And so this was a time where we were the hands and feet um, uh, through ACOA, uh, uh, Tyler and Lee, they, they set this up to where we were able to minister spiritually to people who were coming to get medicine. Okay, so we are providing free medicine, free doctors, and, uh, and, and, and just the ability for these people to walk to a clinic that they couldn't get to. We're in a rural part of, uh, of Uganda, and uh, of, that, of that time, we were there for seven hours straight. Uh, and we're able to see over 100, 804 people, so over 800 It's amazing. And individually share the gospel with them, each person. So, I mean, raise your hand if you prayed with any Ugandan person that day. <laughs> raise your hand if you, if you led any Ugandan person to the Lord that day. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's awesome. And that is amazing. I mean, we're talking about 70, was it 73? 72 people gave their lives to Christ that day. That is fan. That is just, give God a hand, man, because that's not <laughs> working. So, and here's, here's the amazing part. So, um, we're talking a cool refuge, which I, you know, I'm, I sit on the board and I sit on our missions advancement team, and I know they do stuff. Um, our, our pastor, who is most gracious in his giving of time, 
to Tyler, and, and according to Tyler, he gives three times the amount of time for him to come up on stage and talk than any other church that supports them, okay? I still didn't understand the scope and the amount of things that that organization, because that's what it is now, is doing. I thought it was the orphanage. It's way more than that. I think everyone here will attest that what they were able to do with their help, who they've seeded that area in such a way that the ripple effects of eternity in eternity is going to be just profound. Um, so we were also able to go build a house for a lady whose husband abandoned her with four kids. It was a mud house. It was a, it was a dirty job. We were there all day. Um, it was a lot of work, I think. Uh, it, carrying 50-pound balls of of mud, stacking them in an area, and then taking the mud and putting it in between uh, kind of support sticks, uh, wood, you know, not, not straight lumber that you see here, but just literally, they've cut trees. I, I saw them come down. We ran out of some of the wood. They just went to a tree, cut it down with a machete, and, and then we started just putting mud in between. So this is, it lasts for 15 or 20 years. These guys right here, that's what they were able to do. I mean, just showing Christ's love in a, in a tangible way. That's right. Um, was amazing um, that uh, I, I challenge each person here to come up and ask them after service what was the most impactful thing to them. Really, let them be able to articulate and verbalize the, the, the joy that God gave them. That, it, it, was, it was amazing. And I, I, I want to leave you with this. I know I'm going over time, but I, I get excited about this in the sense that we support a co refuge that gave us the ability to go into the harvest field. The workers are few, but the harvest was plentiful. Yeah, it was so much. Right. We should be able to do that here. Pastor Sean gives us the, the, the tools, right? Um, Pastor Mark gives us the tools uh, to share the gospel in a, in a very simple way with the three circles, or maybe you've learned the Romans road, um, but there's ways that we can do it simply and getting to a spiritual conversation. That's what these guys did. Practice doesn't make perfect, but perfect practice gets really close. Hmm. They got to have perfect practice with over 800 individuals that day in sharing the gospel. That I'm, I mean, I know for me, I'll never forget it. I mean, I, it, was, yeah. it was something that it'll be with me forever. And fortunately for the 72 people that gave their lives to Christ, I, we will all be with them forever. How and, cool is that? And thanks to your video, all of us will be... Stop. <laughs> Stop. Uh-huh. You guys, so, yeah. you want to say anything else, Matt? I do, I do, I do. Yeah, one more thing. And then I'll be quiet. Um, for, you, for, for those who don't know about ACOA, look into it. I, I don't know that you're able to see the whole picture. I know, I know Pastor Sean has done an amazing job of, of explaining it. I know Tyler's come here and has done an amazing job. They are, it, is, it is truly an international organization that is having a ripple effect from Uganda to Sudan, Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. They're going into predominantly Muslim countries by virtue of their obedience in Uganda. They're taking pastors that they've trained up in their Bible schools. They've got like 30 translators translating a curriculum for these pastors to go out and share. He believes in disciple making. I think we should too. Yeah, that's good. It was good. awesome. That's Thanks. good. Sorry. Awesome. Thank you. Give Mac a hand. Give these guys a hand. Thank you guys so much. We will... Uh, We'll find ways to hear more of their story later, but like Max said, talk to them and find out more about how, how it really impacted their lives and what happened on that trip. You know, one of the things that Mac mentioned was the three circles. You may not know what that is. And that's a training that we have made available here every so often. It's called Gospel Conversations. And it gives you a very simple way to turn any conversation into a gospel conversation without being weird, unless you're already weird. And then everything's weird anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, And we're going to be offering that training again in just a couple of weeks, right after second service. And it only takes about 15 minutes, but it's so important. In fact, uh, today, uh, I received an email from uh, Julie McKay. Many of you know Dr. Julie McKay. She attends early service. And uh, she uh, serves with Samaritan's Purse. And she was deployed last week. We prayed for her privately. We didn't make it public. I still can't say much about it because uh, she was deployed to an area that's sort of a secret where she's at. And it can't really be told until she comes back what they're doing. Uh, But she sent us uh, an email saying that where she is, 
Uh, and they're there bringing a, a medical relief is why they're there and medical support. And where she is, very dangerous, but she said already she's had the opportunity to share the gospel with so many people who didn't understand the simple gospel, even people who had been in and around church. And she said the, the tool was the three th circles. In the email, she said, thank you, Pastor Mark. Thank you for making that gospel conversation training available, that has been the way she's been able to do that. And so I encourage you in a couple of weeks when we offer that to plan to be here about 15 minutes after service and step into that training and it'll just equip you on a way that you can just be you and yet find ways to share the gospel. And again, Mac and Ben and the team were so proud of you guys, what you did in Uganda. And what's happening there is so powerful. In the early service, Mac said, you know, the orphanage is like the tip of the spear. Um, because what started as a simple orphanage has really begun to transform an entire nation. They have a Philippi project where they rescue women out of human trafficking. They have a Bible school where they train up, they literally trained up hundreds of pastors and planted hundreds of churches. It is amazing, they are the second largest employer in the city of Masaka now. It's what they're doing there is really phenomenal. And so when you pray, when you give and you go, you're a part of making that impact, amen? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that in these next few minutes, that our hearts and minds would be open to you, that you would speak to each one of us through your word and by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. What we've been doing these last few weeks is talking about our church distinctives. And this is important about once a year to come back to this idea because we have people that are new to the church and just because you may have heard it before doesn't mean you actually really understand it or get it or could articulate it. So it's important for us. It keeps us unified as a church to talk about what are our distinctives. And we kicked that off talking about being dedicated to unity. It's one of the reasons why we pray for other churches. That's just one aspect of it, but it's an important aspect of being committed to unity, to say that what, what unites us is greater than what sets us apart and makes us different from each other within the faith. We agree on the main things. And it's important because that way, we, when it comes to the basic things and we say we all agree on this, like for example, Youthquake Live. One of the things in Youthquake Live, we have teenagers and youth groups that come from every denomination in the city that come to be a part of Youthquake Live. Baptist, Assembly of God, Methodist, Anglican, non-denominational, all come because here's what we all agree on. Here's the one thing we all know. Teenagers need Jesus. Anybody agree with that? That's like, let's just start there, right? Let's just, we all agree on that. They all need Jesus. And so we set aside our differences for a greater cause. We're dedicated to unity for the cause of Christ. And these things, they're not sequential, but they are consequential. Because we're dedicated to unity, we are also intentionally generational, which is what Samuel spoke about last Sunday. That we are, for us to really have unity, and it's bringing all the generations together as one community, joining together, right, and as a spiritual family. And Samuel talked about that last week. Because we're generational, we recognize that we are rooted in our history. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, is being rooted in history. And why is that so important? Because I want to hear what God's speaking now. I want the new thing now. What's God saying to me? What's God saying to the church now in this day and age? Yes, that's true. But we also can do that because we're rooted in our history. We do both. Ecclesiastes says a man of wisdom holds on to one extreme and doesn't let go of the other. That can create tension, but that tension is what gives balance. We are rooted in history, but we also embrace our future. In fact, Robert Weber, the author of Ancient Future Faith, he said it this way, the road to the future often runs through the past. This is important because where you come from matters. Where you come from matters. That's why in today's generation, people are so into things like Ancestry.com. You ever see those commercials? Or, or, or how about this one, 23andMe? Anybody done 23andMe? A couple people? So somebody convinced me to do it. So I did the 23andMe. And you know, I found out, I found out something that my family had been telling me all these years is not true. I don't have any Native American in my blood. I was always told, we're part Cherokee. We got this much Cherokee, you know? And I thought, okay, that's cool. We're connected, right? And I'm not. I'm totally 100% Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> but we, we, we're interested in these things because we want to understand our heritage, our, our history. Our family uh, has, a, has a, a family tree book 
that tracks everybody all the way back as far as they can, right? And so a couple of weeks ago, I had a phone call from my cousin because she's updating the family tree and we have a couple of new additions in the family and she's trying to get all the information so she can add it to the family tree and you can go back. And a lot of people like these kind of things because we look back through her history and we go, oh, that person, yeah, they are kind of crazy. Oh, that, that person was famous. I'm gonna tell everybody I was related to that person, right? We like to understand where we come from because it does, it matters where you come from matters. Hollywood caught on to this. That's why, you, anybody watch these Marvel movies? I love the Marvel movies, right? These superheroes. Well, now we, we want to know the origin story of the superhero, right? So then they, everybody's into the origin stories. Hey, even George Lucas did this after he crushed the world in 1977 with Star Wars, and then the Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi. That's not enough. Now we got to understand where all of it come from. So we got the prequels, which some of you are happy about and some of you don't like because of Jar Jar Binks. But we wanna understand the origin. We want origins matter, where you come from matters. Our church is a part of a communion of churches. It's not a denomination, but it's, it's a tighter knit group than say an association. We are a part of the communion of evangelical Episcopal churches. We are evangelical, but we're also Episcopalian in, in this sense. Bishops, that's just a word that means we have bishops that give oversight. So there's accountability and there's continuity. And so we're a part of the communion of evangelical Episcopal churches. And in our communion, they can trace ordination all the way back because as you go through church history, the lines and denominations split off for the first 1,000 years, there's not very many, but then all of a sudden, after the Roman Catholic Church and then during the Reformation, it all splits off into so many different tributaries, but people have documented and kept track on who has ordained who. It's called apostolic succession. And this is what uh, they gave me when I was consecrated. So you can trace your apostol- you can trace your consecration all the way back to the first church. You can go through the book and see that. And when they do it, it because it, it creates an accountability, it takes three bishops to ordain a bishop. You can't just go and announce, I'm a bishop. You know, watch me, I can only go diagonal now. That's it. <laughs> so <laughs> some people are just catching on chess. They move diagonal. Um, But it takes three bishops to consecrate a bishop because there's accountability in that. You know, and there's, there's a covering and there's safety and that's important to understand. Our church is a part of a continuation of the faith. Understanding where we come from matters. Our history forms and informs us. And Jeremiah, and we, we used this during our Ancient Path series last year, Uh, Jeremiah chapter six, it says, thus says the Lord, stand by the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient path where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. Ask for the ancient path. There's some truth there that you need to understand. Our history forms and informs us. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, chapter one, he says, I am reminded, Timothy, of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Paul's using Timothy's history, his background, his heritage, he's using that to speak to who he is now and to his destiny. We believe that understanding our spiritual history does exactly that, it forms us and informs us. And honoring the traditions of our Judeo-Christian heritage, we're able to look to the future with hope and expectation because we are firmly rooted in a faith that has been passed on to us through the generations. It informs us. It exposes us to some of the issues faced by the church in every age. It helps us to see further than we naturally can on our own. It gives us insight into our own culture and it provides warnings about what to look for and what not to do. It forms and informs us. We are rooted in our history. In Psalm 78, uh, last week when Samuel was talking about being intentionally generational, one of the passages we use is out of Psalm 78, verse four, where it says, we will not hide these things from our children, but we will tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he's done. But the verses just prior to that say this, because this all goes together. It's, again, you see how being generational and rooted in history go together. It says, I will open my mouth in a parable. 
and I will utter dark sayings of old, things which we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We're passing on a faith that has been passed on to us. And when it says dark sayings, this doesn't mean scary things or like bad things. It, it means things that are difficult to understand. That's the context. Jesus quotes that same psalm in Matthew chapter 13. He sa it says, all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundations of the world. Jesus is referencing this. It doesn't, and, and in Matthew chapter 13, you can read it says parable after parable after parable. And it doesn't mean that Jesus never spoke anything that wasn't a parable. We know that's not true. And in, in the Sermon on the Mount, it's very direct and very straight on. But in this setting and in this season, he's speaking everything in parables this way to teach them. We are deeply historic. This learning from our, it's, it, this, is, this is us learning from our past. We aren't trying to do something that's just new and innovative to be cool. We're actually trying to simply and historically be grounded in our spiritual heritage, longing to stand on the shoulders of those who came before us in the story of our faith. Robert Weber, who I mentioned a few moments ago in his book, Ancient Future Faith, uh, he does really well of, of uh, recapping how re historians have uh, identified different periods of church history and to see how God worked even in that church history. One of the things that he comments on is that in Israel, reality was always interpreted by the conviction that God was at work in history and especially in the community of faith. God was at work in history. Jesus affirmed this idea. In, in Matthew chapter 10, he celebrates Hanukkah. But Hanukkah is not in Old Testament canon. The Old Testament canon had been complete before the miracle of Hanukkah even happened. It happened in that intertestament period during that 400 years. That's when the miracle of Hanukkah happened. But Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10, he's actually celebrating the feast of, light, the, the, the feast of lights, the Hanukkah. He's celebrating Hanukkah. Jesus is actually affirming that God was at work in history. And so we believe that. God is still at work in history. Being rooted in history means we recite the creeds. These are ancient confessions that recall to us the mysteries of the faith that God is three in one. That Jesus is both fully God and fully man. That death is not the end and that life will reign forever under God. Being deeply historic means we receive the sacraments. These are outward signs of an inward grace. And we'll get into what that means in just a moment. Our church is what has been called a convergence church. We use that word, but we're not the ones that came up with it. And convergence is something that church researchers began to say as they were seeing what God was sovereignly doing in the church. Historically, there are three streams of the church, the sacramental stream, the evangelical stream, the charismatic Pentecostal stream. And there's a blending of these three streams that's, that's happening just supernaturally, something God is doing. And that's important. And the sacramental stream really focuses on God the Father. It's recognizing that God works within this world, but there's a mystery to it. God, he, he, you walk into a cathedral, you walk into a, a, a sacramental church and you instantly feel reverent, you feel the majesty and awesomeness of God and our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? You, you have that sense of awe and that God is working, there's a grace administered. In the, all of us are probably sacramental and don't even know it. Go into, go into some charismatic church before service and they'll be walking around laying hands on the chair. I'm gonna lay hands on this chair and pray for whoever sits here. There's, it's, a, it's a tangible place. That's a sacrament. It's not a sacrament, but that's a sacramental behavior, right? The two sacraments that Jesus ordained were baptism and the Eucharist, communion. We call it Eucharist. That's a Greek word that means thanksgiving because when Jesus was celebrating, he took the bread and he gave thanks. He took the cup and he gave thanks. So it's called the thanksgiving. Most of us have experienced God and encountered God in some way. If we're honest with ourselves, we, we've experienced God or encountered God in some way that falls outside of 
our own theological background or training. And then what do you do? Well, then what people sometimes do is they try to explain it away. Or they try to, but here's the thing. We, can, we can't fit God in a box. God's too big for us to be able to totally understand. And here's what we understand. We understand that there's so much to understand that we will never understand. And we understand that. And that's important. A sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual reality, a change. Baptism is our initiation into the faith. We're having a baptism class today right after service. If you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you to stop by there. It won't, won't take very long and hear a little bit more about what we're going to do next Sunday. It's, a, it's an important time in your life to declare, make a declaration like that. If you've never been baptized, it's our initiation in the faith. The Eucharist, communion is our continuance in the faith. An outward and visible sign. And I, I have encountered God in all of these streams personally. I have encountered God in the sacramental stream. In the sacraments. There have been times when I've had communion and there was something so tangible in that moment that God was in that moment doing something in my life. I even remember the church I grew up in, which was a, a small Episcopal church. I was an acolyte, an altar boy. I'm serving one day, you know, and after the priest does the, the sacraments, something about the way he did it that day, it just, some light went on inside of me. And I was always trained, like, after you receive communion, don't go and, like, talk, just go pray. Go and think and pray and let the Lord work in your life. So I'll just over kneeling, praying, after communion. And something about the way it happened that day, I still remember to this day, I can't even articulate it to you, was so real to me about who God was. I remember looking out the window that was near where I was kneeling, and there was a tree there, and something about the leaves on the tree, and the detail in creation, and the way the sun was coming through the tree, the awesomeness, the, the, the majesty of God, and the, his presence in that moment was so real to me. I've experienced it in baptism when you, when you are doing that moment and seeing people baptized and you see something happening in their life that you can't fully understand. It's an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual reality, an inward and spiritual grace. I've encountered God through the emphasis of an evangelical friend who helped me understand what it means to have a personal relationship with God by putting my faith in Jesus Christ. Something I didn't really understand until that moment. Until this friend who some of you have met, Bruce, my big brother, uh, he was a hardcore Southern Baptist guy, took me on a ski trip with his church, and it was there that I had this, this revelation of what it means to really have a personal relationship with God. I yielded my life to Jesus, even though I had grown up in the faith, and I, and, and I had grown up around it, and there were certain aspects of it I understood. I never really fully surrendered until that moment, and I did in that moment. And then I began to understand how important it is to study the Bible, this reading the Bible, studying the Bible. We're about to kick off a book study. We're gonna go through the book of James together as a church because sometimes line upon line, just going through scripture is so critical and so important. And we're gonna do that together as a church. Bible study, personal Bible study, a personal relationship with God. I've encountered God that way so many times once I was taught to study the Bible for myself. It would be in that moment as I'm studying the Bible that something would happen inside of me, that God would speak to me or use, that, use what I was studying that day in some conversation later on that day that I didn't even know I was gonna have, but now I was equipped for it. I've encountered God in charismatic worship and personally experience the moving of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people are afraid of the Holy Spirit. Don't, you should be afraid of a church that doesn't have the Holy Spirit. If we could do church without the Holy Spirit, what are we doing? We need the Holy Spirit, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. The gifts, it, the study of, of how the Spirit works, pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit's working in our lives, he's working even right now. He's working in your life, even as you're listening to these words, he's working. The gifts of the Spirit, I've seen those happen. I can't explain it all. I've seen people prayed for and get healed. And I've seen people prayed for and it, that wasn't the outcome. I can't explain it. I hope this doesn't make you too nervous. But one, one, ex, one example uh, that I was reminded this week as I was having lunch with somebody and I was sharing re remembering this story I'd kind of forgotten about. This happened some years ago at Beach's Chapel right down the street. 
And um, during one of their worship services, they, they, they record their worship services, and somebody in the service spoke out really loud in tongues. And then a lot of people just thought, that guy's weird, what's he doing? You know, they didn't have a clue what was going on. Other people thought, I mean, they, just, they knew what it was, they didn't really know what about, anything about it, nothing really happened. The moment goes on, service goes on. Months later, they get contacted by a missionary that the church supports in Asia. This missionary contacts the church and, said, and tells this story, here's what happened. The missionary was home doing paperwork in their, in their house, and they had hired a local uh, lady from the community there to help do some stuff around the house, and she's in the house working. She was from a very rural area, and she's there in the house working. And the lead, missionary's just listening to the service, and when that portion of the service happened where this person spoke out very loudly, this lady that's working in the house falls on the ground crying uncontrollably. The missionary doesn't put two and two together and thinks something has happened to this person. Goes over and she's trying to calm her down, asks her, is she okay, did she get hurt, is she unwell, what's going on? Finally, this lady composes herself and she says, what are you listening to? And she says, that's a church that supports us back in the States. And she said, whoever was just speaking on there called me by name. And said, I can't remember the other parts of the story of what this person said and how she was to yield her life to God. This missionary ends up praying with her, takes her home, tells the story to her whole family. How do you explain that? You just have to say, you know what? God is God all by himself. He will not be controlled or put in a box. We're simply saying, God works in all these streams. We don't have to exclude one, let's make space for other. And it's actually a more Trinitarian approach, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's acknowledging all three and giving space in our hearts and in our worship for all three streams to be expressed. It's important that you understand how your history has brought you to this moment so that you don't despise any portion of your journey because for a person, say for example, who grew up in a sacramental background that didn't understand having a personal relationship with God and then they learn that, now they can look back on that and despise that, they didn't teach me right. But actually that was part of your journey that even got you to this moment or so on. So the, so the idea here is don't despise where you come from, recognize that God used that, that's part of your, your journey. Don't despise the old, don't despise tradition, don't despise these things, they form us. And don't resent the new. We need to make room for the new. God's still moving. He says that many times in scriptures, like, look, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I'm doing something new. God's doing something new. So we wanna be ready for the new while we're rooted in, our, in the faith of our history. We're rooted in our heritage. We, want, we wanna embrace both. Understanding our spiritual history forms and informs us. We do have hope for the future because we are rooted in a faith that has been passed on to us through the generations. One last thing I want to share with you, and then Jarrett's going to come and, and lead us in communion. I want to read something to you. I, did I, I think, did I show you guys a book earlier? No, that was first service. There's a book I want to let you know about. Part of my job is to, the, the role of the pastor is to equip the saints, right? It's for equipping. And this is a book I want to encourage you to maybe look at, Gordon T. Smith. Uh, this is not a hard book to read. He wanted to make it very accessible for everybody, although it has a lot of scholar, uh, a scholarly study behind it and academics behind it. It's written in such a way that the average one of us can, can, can in, in, embrace it and understand it. And it's a great book on evangelical, sacramental, Pentecostal, why the church should be all three. You can take that a look at that. But another book... Uh, that is maybe more academic that I don't have on the screen. Uh, it's called The Story of the Creeds and the Councils. This is written by Don Fairbairn and Ryan Reeves. Both are PhDs from Cambridge. This book is more academic. And if you're interested in looking at this, uh, come up and I'll, I'll show it to you. You can, you can check it out. But both of these guys are PhDs from Cambridge and they both come from a reform background. Ryan, a professor at RTS, Reformed Theological Seminary, and Gordon Conwell, so is, Gordon, uh, so is Don Fairbairn. Both of them have more of a Reformed background. Why are two Reformed PhDs writing a book on the councils and the creeds? 
because they, are, they understand how important it is that we stay rooted in our faith and why they're so important. It's a great book. But I want to read something to you that they say at the outset of this book. At the heart of the Christian faith lies not an ethical system, nor a set of commandments, nor even a set of doctrines, but a name. Peter tells the Jewish leaders, there is no other name under heaven given by which men must be saved. Following Jesus' command, new Christians are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. By calling ourselves Christians, we are naming ourselves after Christ our Lord. The most important thing about us is not what we do or even what we believe per se, but to whom we belong as shown by the one whose name we bear. It's about a name, it's about Jesus. Would you stand with me as we prepare here in just a moment to come to communion? All of this, everything we do is about that. That's really the one thing. The, the one creed that we can all hold to is Jesus is Lord. But is he your Lord? That doesn't just mean Jesus is my savior. It means he's my Lord. He rules my life. I yield and surrender to him. Before we come to communion, and this communion is the gospel, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this reminds us that we are in right standing with God because of what he's done for us. But before we come to that, we wanna take a moment and just bow our hearts before him. The Bible says we should examine our hearts. And just, we're gonna confess, we're gonna admit we all sin. Everybody, everybody look around. See all those people? Sinners. You're a sinner, you're, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. I don't mean that in a way that labels you as something, just to say that we all fall short. We're just gonna admit we've all sinned. Because the Bible says, if we admit that, if we admit it, and we confess that we sin, that he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't have to walk out of here today feeling any condemnation, any guilt, any shame. You leave that. You've been cleansed. We're gonna pray a prayer of confession and then a prayer of surrender, just yielding to Jesus as our Lord. I'm gonna lead you, but I wanna encourage you, you pray it and you mean it in your own words, and then we'll come to communion together. Would you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, I confess that I've sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your Son, my Savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I yield to you. Be my Lord. The Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you may have been here before and prayed that prayer before, but if you prayed that and, and, and you meant it for the first time, even if you've said the words but never really meant it, if you prayed that for the first time, we would really like to know that so that we can pray with you and maybe have some resources to support you. Just take one of those communication cards in the seat pocket in front of you and indicate that and drop it in one of the offering receptacles on the way out so that we could you know, pray for you. And let's prepare our hearts right now for communion. Would you go ahead and be seated as Jarrett leads us? At this time, we'd like to invite all those who profess to be followers of Christ to join us in celebrating communion. Uh, for those of you who are online, if you would like to, at this time, this would be a great time to, to gather your communion elements. And for those of you who are with us in person today, if you've not yet received your communion elements, if you will raise your hand, our ushers will be coming up the aisle. You know, this, there's no better example of us being rooted in history than this meal. When we participate in this meal, not only are we, are we here present in this moment, communing with God and communing with each other, but we're also communing, uh, in communion with those around the world who are celebrating this meal at the same time we are. Beyond that, we are, we are look back in history to those who've gone before us, who've, who've said these words and, and, and looked to their salvation and remembered this night. We go all the way back to that night when, when Christ originally 
uh, celebrated this, this meal with his disciples. And we look forward to those who, who will come after us and to that moment when we'll share this meal at the marriage supper of the Lamb with, with our Lord and Savior in person. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that there may be safety and blessing within the gates and walls of your holy city. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that even when our hearts were against you and we'd fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, in your great mercy, you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to live and to die as one of us, to take the burden of our sin and our sickness upon himself and to reconcile us to you once and for all. As we break bread together today, put us in remembrance of that sacrifice and give us a greater understanding of the covenant that we now have with you. We ask that you sanctify this bread and this cup to be for us the uh, body and blood of your son, our savior, and sanctify us also so that we may faithfully serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was handed over to suffering and death, he took bread and he blessed it. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam v'motzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he took it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup of wine and he blessed it. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam bori priagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe who creates the fruit of the vine. And he gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. The Bible teaches us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. At this time, while we remain seated, let's pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. You may now consume your, your elements, and then once you've had a time of, of quiet reflection, please join us uh, in standing for one final worship song. If you need prayer, the altar is open, and we will have our prayer teams available for you.
magnified in me When every creature Find its inmost melody In every human heart It's native cry Oh, the dead What enraptured Be magnified Stand strong and worship you If it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I hold fast to what is true And if the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway Into resurrection life if I join you in your suffering, then I'll join you with you rise. And when you return to glory, all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing. My song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let you're glad he's alive oh man i'm so thankful for that i just want to encourage you thank you for being here with us today what an exciting day god's got some great stuff in store for us but i just want to share this with you when the service is over right at the end of this service pastor's going to be sharing about baptism so if you've wondered about why do we dunk people in water what's the big deal with that why do we have to do what what's going on with that I encourage you, head to that class. I'm glad you asked that question. But right after the service, head into that room right across the hall, and you're going to find out what it is. And I know I talked to some of the kids today. I had, the kids came in with me. I said, how many of you have never been baptized? We had a bunch of kids raise their hand. And I said, talk to your parents. I got their names. So I said, talk to your parents and just let them know that you'd like to get baptized or at least know more about it. So that's right back here in the room. So excited. And you that are watching, we will encourage you. If you're watching and you need prayer for anything, and if you're here in the room and you need prayer, uh, if you're here in the room, don't click the prayer button. But if you're watching, click the prayer button and somebody will be on there to pray with you. But if you are here and you do need prayer, at the end of the service, in stereo, we've got two prayer teams, one on this side and one on that side. So if you'd like prayer for anything you're going through, our prayer team would love to agree with you in prayer and release the power of God. Now, I'm going to release God's blessings on you. Receive this from the Lord. And you that are watching online, do this too. Just lift a hand up toward heaven. You that are here, lift your hands up and just receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. You guys have an awesome day. If you need prayer, come on up.